Okay, welcome everyone to this webinar by MacroHive. We're very pleased to have Professor Justin Stebbing um, to give us his take on this latest uh, virus uh, variant. Uh, just for your background, uh, Professor Justin Stebbing, uh, he's a professor at the Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College. Um, he's uh, written extensively, um, he's, he's, he's published numerous articles in academic journals on a range of different topics, and he has actually published some work on using AI to find drugs to treat COVID-19. And perhaps most important of all, he's been a, a very close follower of the ups and downs of the, the COVID uh, pandemic since it began first at the beginning of 2020. And he's also recently published a book, which we'll also talk about where he documents um, uh, the, the, the spread of the virus over the course of 2020. I think for me, Justin's one of the best sources for um, synthesizing and uh, channeling kind of our understanding of the pandemic at each uh, stage of, uh, of its journey so far. Um, and uh, before we uh, go into the uh, particular uh, topic, um, I just wanted to just give some background to the other people on this call. So there's myself, I'm the CEO and head of research at MacroHive. We also have Dominique dwarf who's uh, who's uh, uh, our senior researcher at uh, MacroHive, who focuses on uh, US economics and strategy. Um, and she's been following the, the spread of, sort of COVID from a kind of case death count and understanding the implications of COVID. If we have time, we'll get her take on the implications of it all um, as, as well. Um, and just for people who don't know anything about MacroHive, so MacroHive is an independent platform for research and analysis. Um, we uh, Let me just show you our, our website just uh, as we uh, prepare um, for, for the webinar. Um, so if I just show you uh, our, our website, you can see um, we, we essentially publish uh, articles almost every day where we provide different insights that's helpful to investors on how to trade different markets. So recently we published pieces on uh, Omicron, the virus, obviously. We talked about which equity sectors would be impacted by Omicron. We look at uh, crypto, Ethereum. Uh, we've had big pieces on that recently. Um, and we also do summaries of academic papers. And you can just sign up um, over here, just go to macrohive.com. You can sign up to become a member to receive all of this. You'll also get access to a Slack room where you'll be able to interact with the research team and other members too. But uh, the, the main reason we're on this uh, call uh, today is really to, to learn more about uh, Omicron, the, the, the variant. Um, so the way we're gonna structure this is I'm gonna just pose a series of questions to Justin and if, any, uh, if anyone in the audience has questions, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your, your Zoom window. If you just post your questions in there, then as I receive them, I'll then be able to pose those questions to Justin. So we'll try to make this as open as possible. I'll start it all off, but feel free to fire questions away um, in, in the Q&A uh, section. Um, and then, um, uh, then we'll have some concluding comments towards the end and hopefully we'll get some time to talk about Justin's book as well, which I also wanted to, to, to flag uh, too. So, so Justin, um, welcome to, uh, to this webinar. It's great to have you on. Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. Uh, we don't know a, a lot um, about the full fallout from Omicron. But you know, from your understanding, you know, perhaps we can start with all of this talk about mutations. There's so many mutations of this variant, which is different from before. Can you just tell us a bit more about that? And based on that, what can that tell us about its transmissibility and its virulence? Can, can we learn much from, from the mutations itself? So it's very, very evolutionary different from the other SARS-CoV-2 viruses. Just to give you an idea, if you look at alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and you take delta, delta had three mutations in the spike. This has 32, of which approximately half are deep in the spike at really important sites for antibody binding, including two of the few in cleavage sites that the virus needs to get into cells. Um, I and others have really been left with egg on their face. I've been talking to structural modelers, such as Steve Burley at Rutgers, members of the team of AlphaFold, and we thought you could only have a very small number, maybe up to say 10 at the most, mutations in the spike protein. And after that, it might collapse. So here now we see 32 mutations, got that completely wrong. 
which just goes to show that what you think in theory and what nature can create and what practice can create are totally different things. And there's so many mutations that when I was talking to the team at Imperial who had sequenced it, the main sequencer, who's first author on the paper or the sequence describing it, said he thought they got the metadata mixed up with another bat, Sabi Kov, and that something wrong had happened. That's clearly not the case. And on that basis, and if we're going to be at all guided by science, I can see the alarm now. If you take the E484K vaccine resistant previous mutation, that was one mutation that knocked at least 20 percentage points off vaccine efficacy. Now this doesn't have E484K, it has E484A, but it has numerous other mutations. So to suggest as the BioNTech CEO or the University of Oxford have that va vaccine efficacy won't be that reduced, I think is an error. But again, we're going to need laboratory studies to confirm this and then clinical studies to confirm this. Provided that the virus continues to spread and cause problems because it's possible that because of the number of mutations, it's so unstable that it actually, in a different environment, so getting off a plane in warm South Africa, going to Holland or London, in a different colder environment, the virus itself isn't stable and that in a couple of weeks time, this completely peters out and is gone. And that's part of the reason why some of the vaccine companies didn't make, didn't make variant specific vaccines because they did so with beta and then by the time they finished that, beta was gone. You have to remember that gamma, remember gamma? People, <laughs> one that infected millions of people in Brazil, but restrictions managed to get rid of that. Now you could counter that by saying, well, it was outcompeted by Delta. And that is an argument. And there's arguments to them for everything. But at the beginning of the week, we thought based on its growth trajectory, there would be at least 10,000 cases per day in South Africa, if not more. And that's not the case. South Africa population is similar to the UK and Germany, where there's 40 to 65,000 cases a day. There's only 2,500 cases per day or thereabouts in South Africa. It is going up, but it's not going up with an R naught of six or seven that some people said. We're not talking about rice in a chessboard and more atoms in the than in the universe by the end of it. But we are seeing a slightly different picture. We're seeing in adults, shorter duration infections, not so respiratory, night sweats, which we've never heard of before, sore throats, blocked noses. But of course, the most worrying thing we're seeing is we're seeing sick toddlers, babies under the age of two, brought to hospital with fever and lethargy and tachycardia, and that's fast heart rate. And of course, if you bring a baby to hospital, that baby who's sick, that baby will be admitted because it's not like an adult that you can say, well, if you get sicker, come back because the baby's not going, really going to tell you. And when they become sicker, they just sleep more, which is a bit scary. And no one's going to take the risk with the baby of sending it home in case something tragic happens. And so you do have a potentially nasty constellation of things that's occurring. And I've also outlined you also have a potentially very good scenario. So on the basis of such a broad fan of outcomes, the uncertainty is very, very troubling, to say the least, as uncertainty always is troubling. And you can see why people have reacted in the way they have. And I actually think that the political and the transport and the travel responses to this have been absolutely proportionate and correct and sensible. It's very difficult in these situations because you have some people saying lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. I can tell you right now that I just went to Pret-a-Manger in central London to buy my tuna baguette for lunch. I know this gourmet meal. And there were two people really protesting inside about mask wearing. I mean, these are people obviously with a lot of time on their hands and things, but, but really like ferociously shouting and protesting. And you've got people both ends of the spectrum. And I actually think that governments have actually steered a fairly prudent and sensible path here. 
So I think I've gone into a bit more detail than you're expecting. And no, I'm no, that's fine. No, no, that's great. Um, I mean, one thing I forgot to mention, I was supposed to give a disclaimer before, before the call that uh, we're not giving any financial advice here and that there won't be any non-public information as well. So everything is based on public sources and personal opinions, uh, just, just reference. So, so Justin, this, this point about the, um, the transmission um, and the number of cases that you, you know, you had said, you know, uh, you would have expected like 10,000 cases a day. And we've seen those charts of a very sort of sharp move up in Omicron. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's so early, but like, how, how should we understand the number of cases picking up around the world? You know, it, you know, at what point do you start to think, okay, this is very bad from, from the case counts? I don't think we're there yet. We have thus far in the EU 44 cases in 11 different countries. Yeah. There's a, a lot more in South Africa. And we're not hearing about, if you can imagine with the virus, there's, I think there's three things to consider. And imagine an elastic band in your hands with three corners. On the one corner, you have the infectiousness and transmissibility. On the next corner, you have the vaccine evasiveness. And on the next corner, you have the ability of the virus to cause bad symptoms, ITU admissions, hospitalization, deaths. It would be very unusual and not like the nature of a biological entity like a virus for all three things to go up together. Not impossible, but very, very unusual. And I don't really understand whether viruses are living or dead. I don't really fully understand their aims other than to replicate. But it's almost as if we're seeing evolution fast forwarded here. And this is the virus's way of adapting to live with us. Because the one thing I had the highest conviction on is its vaccine evasiveness. I have less conviction on its transmissibility and how transmissible it is, because it seems so different to Delta that it's maybe possible to me that there's very little cross immunity and someone could be infected with both. Hmm. So infection with Delta doesn't protect against this. But if that's true, then it should cause fewer symptoms. Now, because of the age structure of Southern Africa, we're not able to see, obviously, hmm. if, it's gonna result in severe hospitalizations and deaths because it's a ton of young people basically. But you could argue on the other hand, young people with mild symptoms is still very worrying. But then you could argue, well, this likely evolved in an immunocompromised HIV positive host. It didn't kill them or cause them significant harm over a long period, we think. Therefore, it's probably not going to be that dangerous. So there's many ways of thinking about this. It does, though, seem sufficiently different from the other SARS-CoV-2 viruses to really raise a lot of issues generally. I think that the antivirals, the tablets, which are designed to prevent hospitalization, are very timely. When it comes to Pfizer's pill, there is a mutation in the protease of Omicron and Pfizer's pill binds to the protease, but the mutation isn't in the binding site where Paxlovid binds. It's quite far away. And when it comes to Merck's pill. And just so, so just on that Pfizer yeah. one, by saying that you mean that it's potentially less effective against Omicron because no. it's away from the binding site? Or... No, so the, the, the drug binds in the binding site, which isn't affected by the mutation. Ah, uh, sorry, okay, that way around. Okay, so it, it, so then it rule, it should in theory retain its effectiveness. It should do, but if you imagine a 3D shape yeah. and a lock and a key, if you change, even though the key is going into the lock, if you change maybe some aspect of the door, you could still affect the key okay. going in, yeah. even though it's not quite. Yeah. So we know that distant, changes in protein structure can still affect an area a bit far away. We call that an allosteric effect, but yeah. for the most part, sure. I don't really want to get into that. And then yesterday, the FDA narrowly 13 to 10 with a vote, an FDA advisory committee. The FDA doesn't always listen to its advisory committees, but usually does, voted to approve Merck's pill. To my surprise, because the data looked pretty mixed in comparison to Merck's initial press release and no studies in pregnant or lactating people and issues like that. 
issues about the mechanism of Merck's drug, which is to introduce errors in replication, which can create a theoretic cancer risk. But to me, the main thing is we're also now, as well as the vaccines, and vaccine platforms will be able to change rapidly now within weeks. We're going to have antiviral pills. Now, the bigger an issue Omicron is, the lower the regulatory hurdle. So there'll be this natural slack in the system and this slight rear stack. In the same way, when cases go up, we naturally stay in a bit more. Yeah. If COVID is, if this is worse, then the FDA and other regulatory authorities will be more sort of lax. It's yeah. a natural reaction to get things happening very quickly, if you see what I mean. And and just to be clear, in terms of how the antiviral pills work compared to the vaccines, um, you know, how, how would you sort of describe that to a layperson in terms of like the difference? Well, I always think prevention is better than treatment. Okay. And an issue with an antiviral pill is you develop symptoms, you do a COVID test, you're positive, you then have to somehow telemedicine, whatever, get a prescription, get it from pharmacy. It's not a great... There's a lot okay. of tablets involved, 30 with Pfizer, 40 with Merck, whatever, whatever. They're expensive. A vaccine's 20 bucks. These pills in the West are going to be $500 or $700. There's, it's not straightforward. I always think prevention is better than a treatment. And of course, if you get infected, there's the spectrum of long COVID and yeah. so forth. But it's possible that these vaccines don't offer any protection whatsoever. And I think the Israeli data saying that Pfizer protects is really poor quality. That's okay. come out over the last, that's all over Twitter. I think I was yeah. very surprised to see that tweeted because they're basically saying the four cases in Israel didn't have the Pfizer vaccine, therefore the Pfizer vaccine protects. I think they would have studied it a bit more, but to me, to make those sorts of assertions to a very sensitive kind of world is the wrong time and place. We just don't have the information. And and in terms of, um, you know, Omicron's come at the time when we're learning that the vaccine efficacy falls over time. You know, if you've had a vaccine second dose first, dose, whatever, six months ago, it starts to wane over time. And then at the same time, you have this other natural immunity, people have been infected, and that provides some kind of resist, you know, um, immunity of sorts. I mean, how, how do you think about those two forms of immunity mm. in relation to the, the Omicron? We don't know whether... Infection with Delta protects you from Omicron. We okay. don't know whether recent vaccination and having booster vaccination protects you from Omicron. Okay. We don't know whether it protects you from being infected by it, transmitted, whether it protects you from ill health, hospitalization or death. <laughs> okay. So what we've learned from the vaccine so far is the vaccine might not be very good at protecting you from infection. A good example of that might be AstraZeneca. But it's still very good at protecting you from hospitalization and death. So they're good at protecting you in different ways. The most worrying finding is its ability to affect children under the age of two. Yeah. And and, and that can really, that, that will cause absolute pandemonium and panic in the West because... Yeah. Mothers will stay at home. They won't want fathers to go out, labor, inflation, and just yeah. strain on pediatric beds. And there aren't many pediatric beds. And I wouldn't underestimate a lot of talk. I'm asked questions about South Africa. And there was a question in the chat room on South African data. Yeah. And I would tell you that the South African Infectious Diseases Network is far more developed world than most countries in the West because of their <laughs> HIV experience. Okay, cancer care might not be as good and other care might not be as good and long-term residential facilities and whatever, whatever, but I can assure you that they know how to deal with infections better than we do because of their mm -hmm. HIV experience, particularly yeah. in children where we have almost no experience in that sort of thing compared to them. And your your point about the on the on the ch children's side, I mean, that obviously sounds very worrying. Outside of South Africa, do we have what evidence do we have of that outside of South Africa? Has it absolutely appeared? none? Because we have forty four cases in the EU who are either asymptomatic or mildly mm. 
affected, but what we don't have is a breakdown of their ages and so forth. But to, to have 10% of all admissions in Gauteng being toddlers under two is a really shocking thing yeah. to read. I don't know what percent, for example, of those are HIV positive, just for example. J just one question. I don't know how sick they are. I do know there has been a death in a presentation okay. from the South African Ministry of Health two days ago that I was saying. And with, with Delta and with Beta, did we have, how did it affect toddlers or under twos? Less so. You know that, you know, the incidence of MISC or this Kawasaki disease or this multi-system inflammatory syndrome yeah, yeah, that affects yeah. kids affected one in a hundred thousand children. The reason to vaccinate children is not to protect the children, it's to stop symptomatic transmission mm, to their yeah. grandparents. So to have actually something that can come along and infect children. Is, the point about the children and the school closures and so forth is to me, this is the one thing that could lead to lockdowns everywhere. If children start becoming sick and dying, that's lockdown material. Whereas Biden was very relaxed a couple of days ago saying there won't be any more lockdowns. Dominique will know more about this than me. But I was amazed he said that in the absence of further data, but he's running short in the polls. And to be honest, there probably won't be another lockdown if this resembles previous COVID waves. But if it starts infecting and damaging children and placing a strain on pediatric beds, to me, that's it. That's game over for... Yeah movement in the west no they, I, mean, I don't really know dominique will agree with that and she knows yeah. more about that than me but you know i mean Dom dominique i mean do you want to chip in there in terms of biden's response if you just uh, unmute yourself uh, dominique sure we have an election in the us uh in less than 11 months uh, the Democrats have a razor thin majority, uh, both uh, in the House and in the Senate. Uh, and uh, the response to COVID is going to be a big driver of the election. The American public is desperate for normality. Um, there has been big differences in how the pandemic was uh, handled in the blue and red states, and there is pressure uh, on the blue state to be much less heavy handed with uh, uh, lockdown. So I suspect this is what's driving the, uh, the response. So I, I mean, if I may ask, um, there is so much uncertainty around, can we really fall uh, Biden? Uh, and specifically, uh, in the US, uh, genomic surveillance is so limited. In uh, April, there was an article in Nature saying that basically the US sequences less than 1% of uh, COVID cases. Uh, that in terms of uh, you know, sequencing, it's a 33rd country in the world, or was a 33rd country in the world. So how confident are we that uh, uh, we have a good handle on the spread of Omicron? I don't think we have a good handle on it at all, but I would say two things. It's not just the article in Nature, Dominique. We all know that in the UK, we're sequencing up to 50% of, sa of samples in America. It's like one to 2%, Denmark, somewhere in between. The difference is you don't need to sequence this one because of the mutation profile, it's very easy to detect via PCR. Oh. So you don't need formal sequencing. But to me, and I'd rather look on the positives, this is a real time example of global genomic surveillance for the first time ever working. Hmm. I think in 10 years time, sequencing and genomics will be a part of our everyday lives, whether it's buying fresh food or screening for diseases in people. I think it will be a, a part of our everyday existence. And what we're seeing with Omicron is actually a futuristic example that genomics and real-time genomics, however you want to call it, sequencing or PCR, and you don't need to sequence for this, is actually working. And that's really, really sort of interesting news for humanity and shows that genetics it's just going to be really, really important to all of us going forwards. No, that's great, Justin. And um, I mean, I wanted to talk about timelines, but before we go mm -hmm. into that, just, yeah. just a couple of kind of the, 
the typical questions that come up, you know, number one, seasonality of COVID in general, you know, obviously in Europe, we're seeing kind of a wave that was occurring anyway. I mean, what's your view on seasonality? And then the other one is on non-pharmaceutical interventions like mask wearing, um, things yeah. like that, you know, what your your take is on, on those, those, uh, those two issues. So early on in the pandemic, there was a slew of papers on the effect of weather or climate on the virus. And that's generally divided into two which is temperature and humidity. Okay. And I read them all and I got more and more and more confused. And one thing said one thing and one thing said another, but these viruses tend to like slightly colder weather, which is why Africa isn't known for its great flu outbreaks. And then I realized that the effect of the weather has nothing to do with the effect on the virus. It's an effect on our behavior, very cold weather forcing us indoors and very hot. Yeah and warm weather making us go outdoors or very hot weather making us go indoors with air conditioning, which can be really bad, unidirectional airflow. And I'll go back to the, the first comment I made that because the number of mutations in the spike protein, the change in weather from South Africa to Europe might make this really, really unstable. And so in two weeks time, this may have completely disappeared. Um, you know, Simple yeah. as that. And, and mask wearing, you know, the effect. Yeah, mask when wearing. it comes to non-pharmaceutical interventions, to me, the best one and the most underestimated one is ventilation. Oh, OK. Yeah. And um, really impressive. But I think mask wearing is important and decent and social distancing and hand washing less so. That's what I think. I mean, mask wearing has been proved in enough studies to be effective, whether whether they're circumstantial studies i.e., you know, areas that introduce mask wearing have fewer infections or actual physical studies showing that people infected are less likely to pass it on if they're wearing a mask. You know, I think there's genuinely enough evidence to suggest that mask wearing prevents it. And that's why the government in the UK, you know, at 4 a.m. on Monday morning, made it a legal requirement but i can tell you walking around london i'm not seeing anyone wearing masks very few people wearing yeah, masks. yeah i'm seeing people working in the shops wearing masks but i'm not seeing people that are going into the shops wearing masks and i think it's just fatigue i don't think people are vehemently anti-masks i just think people are just tired of it all yeah now in terms of timelines i mean how, how are you thinking about you know uh it, you know, is the next two, three weeks, is this the period where we learn yeah, more? I about... would actually say the next week. Okay. Because by the next week, you know, what we really want is you've got 10,000 people infected. These are vaccinated. These are unvaccinated. These are their ages. These ended up in hospital. These ended up in ITU. These ended up worse. These ended up better. Who are those groups? Now, if we don't get that, then that paradoxically means it's sort of gone away. Okay. And if we do get it, we'll know exactly what to do, who's vulnerable, who's at risk, and whether the vaccines work. Because I strongly suspect that Stefan Bansell, the CEO of Moderna, is correct when he's totally worried about this. I don't see how people can't look at the spike mutation sequence and not be exceedingly worried because it's so different. Now, just to keep in mind, <coughs> the existing vaccines we've had... <coughs> You all use the original China sequence published on January the 10th. Yeah. Now, straight after that sequence was published, the virus mutated to include something called a D614G mutation in the spike. And then we had the alpha, beta, gamma, delta mutations. Okay, yeah. And they didn't make variant specific boosters or variant specific vaccines because they did. And then the variants went away or the existing vaccines covered it. But I don't think my view is that the existing vaccines can cover this. Now, vaccines are designed to, vaccines, just to be clear, are designed to induce antibodies, but so are antibody treatments. And you can't have it both ways. You can't say antibody treatments aren't gonna work, but vaccines are gonna work because they both are antibodies. The, the end product is an antibody against the virus or against the spike protein. So you can't have it both ways. And some people are choosing to have it both ways. Okay. Justin, in terms of, uh, you know, we've just discussed how different countries 
have different uh, quality of monitoring of the pandemic. In the US, obviously, our decentralized health policy is just multiplying the difficulty of managing the pandemic. So which, can, which country do you expect to come up first with the most reliable uh, estimate of what the, this Omicron really means for us? No, oh, to me, it has to be Israel, which is because of their data collection, their organization, the fact that they've all had one vaccine, the fact that a lot okay. of people are on longitudinal studies with assessments and they don't have the data privacy issues in America that prevent a lot of contact tracing and so forth. So I think we'll get a good Okay, so Israel's the one to watch. The next uh, week or so, next week even, is, is kind of a crucial yeah. week to see whether... <laughs> You know, hopefully yeah. it dies out. But if it doesn't, then we'll have the 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 uh, width, the, the breadth of data to understand it better. I, I think so. If we don't have the breadth of data in a week, it, to me, it's a problem that's gone away. Yeah, I think that's that's not unrealistic. The 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 fly in the ointment, and it's a very big fly, is this kids thing because mm. that has the possibility. Let's say vaccines do protect. We still can't vaccinate toddlers age zero to two. So, and you remember babies lose their antibodies at six months to 12 months. They don't have any natural antibody protection because the antibodies from breast milk wear off by then. And then mm. their immune systems start to form. So it's a very risky time, generally. Yeah, yeah. And of I course, when an adult becomes sick, they just say, I'm feeling more breathless. A baby doesn't- You just don't know, yeah. You just don't know, it's veterinary medicine. You can't really talk to your patients. Yeah. And and in terms of vaccine development and booster development and everything, so let's say, you know, in a week or two, we learn that, okay, the existing vaccines aren't that effective. Like, mm. what's the timeline to kind of create a new vaccine, distribute it? And because um, mm. I, I saw comments I, from Pfizer. I, I think it's much quicker than everyone's thinking. I okay. would, I think that all that will be needed, if it's a problem, yeah. is we'll have, they're, they're making it now. A trial of healthy volunteers will take two weeks and then scaling it up and distributing it. And don't forget, these companies have produced huge manufacturing capacity, overcapacity, in fact, you know, will take just can occur then and there. Really, really quick. If it's a problem, if it's not a problem, the regulators will say, well, do trials and do normal okay. studies and so forth. So I think either way the vaccines will come along and sort it out and we'll have the antivirals, the Pfizer one in particular. Yeah. Um, okay, I just wanted to sort of put a shout out to the audience. I mean, start uh, firing questions um, uh, away. Uh, you can start posting it in the q and I have a few more questions left, but sure. uh, do start posting your questions, everybody. Um, now, Justin, just one, one question on long, you mentioned long COVID earlier. Um, you, you kind of hear about this in the news media a lot and, you know, in my personal social circle, I kind of know one person maybe with long COVID, but you know, from the newspapers, it seems like it's a bigger issue. I mean, what were your thoughts around long COVID? And yeah, I mean, I've actually spent quite a lot of time looking at it. One of the problems is there's no easy way to define and measure it and follow it up. And there's no great drug treatment for it. I think it does exist. I think it's much rarer. True long COVID is much rarer than people think, but I think the psychological interplay between not being able to go out, be isolated, financial stress, employment stress is very, very intertwined with it. And it's very difficult to dissect out the physical and some of the mental consequences of the virus, as opposed to the consequences of the virus affecting the world around us. I think it's a very difficult area. Mm. Um, you know, there are long COVID clinics in hospitals and the way, you know, is people, if you compare it with people that have had a very bad viral pneumonia and have been on intensive care for a long time, we're not seeing things that are necessarily that different to those people. It's just many more people affected. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Um, we're, we're getting a few questions now. One is um, on, on the toddler side, would breastfeeding past six months help protect babies? So if you just prolong... No, uh, I don't think so, because you only get the antibodies from breast milk straight away. Uh, okay. In the initial times, and then they last for six months. Yeah. I don't think breast milk, it's the initial breast milk after a birth that gives the protection. Okay. It's not the breastfeeding that occurs later, but the antibodies transferred initially wear off after six months. Okay. 
Um, there's a question on, is the high incidence of AIDS amongst children in South Africa uh, skewing the numbers? Um, it's not that high, it's about 2.5%. So that's why I mentioned earlier, you would want to see how many are HIV positive. It might do, but I doubt it based on the 2.5%. Okay. And uh, on, the, uh, on the vaccine effectiveness, um, someone's saying we're getting different messages. So you interpret Moderna's caution as, as uh, is it around protection against infection or is it uh, around hospitalization death? I think all they can look at to start with is protection against infection. Okay, yeah. Because it's possible that this could, Omicron could be a blessing in disguise. If there's no cross immunity from previous infection with Delta or whatever, or Beta or vaccination to it, and this doesn't cause real sickness, then it could be a blessing in disguise. Yeah. But we don't, we just don't know yet. And I think Moderna's caution is just based around simply saying, well, the spike protein, which is the vaccine target, is so different that we need to be cautious. Yeah, yeah. You, when I listened to the interview with uh, Moderna, it, it sounded really well balanced and reasonable. I mean, basically That's saying, true. you know, it's it's something very different. We just don't know yet. So, you know, yeah. let, let's, let's just see. Um, okay, there's another question around uh, antigens. What are your thoughts about the specificity of T cell responses generated by the vaccine? And are, there non, are they non-specific enough to be protective against Omicron? I think that's a great question. I mean, when I think of T cell responses, I'm thinking more the adenoviral vectored vaccines such as AstraZeneca and J&J, although Moderna and Pfizer, the mRNA vaccines do induce CD4 responses. I, to me, we just don't know about cross immunity when it comes to T cells and B cells. And if there is a CD4 T cell response, that should induce B cell antibody production. We just don't know. I wish I could answer that in greater depth. I think it's a great question. We, we just don't know. Okay. Um, and then there's another question on booster programs. So mm -hmm. if individuals get booster now, and then the mm -hmm. boost has to change, would you still have the time lag where you need like three, six months before you get the next booster? Or are they kind of orthogonal from each other? If I, think a... will, I think they're orthogonal from each other. And that and that people will be willing to, if, if Omicron becomes a real problem, people will be willing to have boosters containing the Omicron sequence, I believe in February and March when they'll be available. Okay. okay. And don't forget you have the spectre of flu and the issue is mild COVID plus mild flu may equal a very serious disease. Okay, yeah, yeah. And we just, but we just don't know yet. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so listeners, feel free to uh, fire more questions. I had another question, Justin, just in terms of there's some countries in Asia, like China, that seem to be following like kind of a zero COVID strategy. So they have kind of very restrictive on the borders. They, they really sort of clamp down with this. Well, they can do, city. can't they? Because they don't need any of us to come there for whatever reason. They, 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 OK, <laughs> yeah, they, I was going to ask know, China, China's a net exporter of many things. Why do you think this is called Omicron and not C, which was the yeah. next letter in the alphabet? <laughs> and that's not a joke. That's absolutely serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, OK, understood. Um, Do Dominique, did you have any any additional questions? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, um, so one thing is uh, the science, which is going to get settled quite soon. I think the other aspect in terms of uh, devising a uh, policy response is the willingness of the public to be, th to be put through inconvenience, or let's call a mild inconvenience, such as mask. And given this, that, you know, the with we seem to have exhausted quite a, or used up quite a bit of the public's patience. Uh, what do you see as at this stage as the measures that is both the most effective from a science perspective, but also the most likely to be followed uh, by the public? I think the most, the best measure is boosters in vaccination. But the, hang on, but. I just don't know and don't think they'll protect adequately from Omicron, but I'm not sure how much of a problem Omicron is going to end up being. I mean, for example, today we heard that an Omicron sequence was detected in Nigeria in October. Yesterday, we heard that it was detected earlier in November 
November 19th in Holland. We're not seeing the numbers of Omicron going up and up and up. And if you actually look at the slow, if you go to next strain and put in South Africa, we're still seeing Delta massively predominating, although it is taking over in Gauteng, it's not taking over in the whole of South Africa. And so, and the actual um, slope of the Omicron rise is not as great as Delta was. So I think boosters is the best thing. I, and hopefully Omicron won't come along and start displacing Delta or co-infecting with Delta in the West. If it does, we've got real problems. And there's a few, few, more, few more questions from the audience. One was in terms of upcoming news flow, mm -hmm. are you, what's more important, the analysis of, of the, you know, the cohorts of you know, cases, hospitalization mm -hmm. and so on, or is it sort of tests around vaccine antibody? Yeah. Um, so we're going to hear a load of negative news flow. Of that, I have zero doubt <laughs> okay. that regular antibodies, therapeutic antibodies and vaccine-induced antibodies don't adequately neutralize this. I have no doubt. Yeah, you may see one or two studies saying it does, but the majority will say it doesn't. I have zero doubt about that. But those studies aren't as relevant as the real life ones. Yeah. And the real life ones will give us answers. And if Omicron is, is as bad as some people say it's going to be, then we'll have those answers really soon. If we don't get the answers soon, then Omicron's not really a problem. Okay. So it's sort of a, yeah. We're, yeah. We're, you're sort of going to know both ways. Yeah, yeah, understood. Yeah. So the real world examples are most important and uh, yeah. the absence or not will tell us a lot. Um, you know, one thing the COVID pandemics taught us is that real world evidence is really, really important. Yeah. Uh, we had another question um, asking, you know, we're obviously seeing these big delta waves in Europe right now. Europe had high vaccination levels. So why, why, why is that? Why, why are we seeing such high number of cases in Europe, despite, you know, vaccinations being relatively high? Just because antibody protection wanes off after six months and yeah simple as that and you know Europe started vaccinating relatively late and they yeah. haven't done the boosters yet so we're in that window period yeah yeah simple as that and and someone's asking um and also it was you know people are scared of France yeah because of the anti-vaxxers there but then France mandated vaccinations whereas the big problems are like in Germany and Austria, where there's still a lot of very unvaccinated people. Now, I'll be careful what I say, but I've had discussions with anti-vaxxers and there is nothing, there is no rationale, no reasoning that can, you know, these, you know, and in America as well. You know, there's a lot of people in the States that believe the world is flat, right? There, there's no <laughs> argument, rationale, or reasoning with these people, in my opinion. There's no science, there's no, I'll just, you know, I'll just yeah. leave it at that. <laughs> okay, yeah. And that um, is a problem for the world. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, yeah. Greece now is gonna find unvaccinated people every month. Um, different countries will do different things. In America, you know, state lotteries to, and awards and guns and fishing trips to <laughs> great people to have vaccination work for at least 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, Okay, there was there was a question on natural immunity, which was um, around uh, what was the chance of reinfection? Did it has it stayed low uh, between variants or not? No, it's high, okay. but it just happens after about six months. Okay. Um, the issue I have with natural immunity is that yeah. natural infection can really mess up your immune system and mess up your immune response, and it okay. can stun your immune system which is why we prefer, people like me prefer vaccination to give the advantages of the immune response without the disadvantages of organ specific damage and general immune damage in other aspects of the immune system. Yeah, yeah, okay, There's, yeah, it, it's not free lunch, so to speak. Um, uh, one person's asking, you know, your, your comment about, you know, the risk to young children. I mean, is there a chance now that authorities just won't share that information to the public, that they'll try to sort of keep no, that under wraps? I can't, I can't imagine that. I think that would be very surprising. The one thing we've learned, about, another thing we've learned about COVID is data sharing has become really important. And I have to say that I've been really, I'm an editor of one of Nature's journals. Yeah. And 
we've had a lot of issues with Chinese data in the past. But yeah. one thing I'm really encouraged by is we're seeing a lot of negative Chinese studies published for the first time. So when China did a study of remdesivir, it was negative. When they did lipinavir, ritonavir, it was negative. So to me, it's been really encouraging that we're seeing negative data, negative studies coming out of China. And it shows that things are not always as they are perceived or they used to be. Yeah. Uh, we have a question about India. Mm -hmm. Um like essentially, you know, the country's got relatively low vaccination. There's no mm. booster program there. Obviously, it, it was, you know, got heavily affected by Delta. Um, is, is that a country to watch as well? Or I, I, I really think I'm surprised India hasn't been mentioned. Earlier on in the Omicron, about a few days ago, India was one of the first countries to close its border, I think, to about 20 countries, not just mm. countries in southern Africa. And... Um, so the government there is very worried. If you look at which countries India closed its borders to in terms of flights, very early in the Omicron kind of worry. Um, the whole India thing is a worry. People thought India reached herd immunity in 2020, how wrong they were. They thought yeah. that about Manaus and Brazil as well, with very high infection rates. And we know, we don't need reminding that this virus can come in waves, either the same type or easier still different types. So if Omicron does turn out to be a problem, I think there'll be very little cross immunity protecting us. That's just my personal view. Yeah. Which, which then means the idea of herd immunity doesn't really make sense then. I think notion. Israel taught us that herd immunity doesn't exist. They reached like 90% vaccination and then saw a wave in unvaccinated children, right? Yeah. They yeah, taught yeah. us that herd immunity for this virus, for whatever reason, doesn't really exist. And I subscribe to that belief. Yeah. And, and we've got a few questions about what, what is the end game here? You know, at what point does this become like seasonal flu? You know, I think it's possible that Omicron, if it doesn't cause major sickness, becomes like a seasonal flu virus. Okay. Okay. Nice Simple as that. Yeah. But okay. I, mean, I think of COVID as being about twice, the way I think of it as a very primitive doctor. Yeah, because I'm a real simpleton, is I think about it as being twice as bad as the flu. Okay, yeah. Yeah, understood. Someone's asking a question, um, is long COVID related to post sepsis syndrome? I don't know what similar, that is. It's very there. similar. Or delirium people experience on ITU. When you look at people with post sepsis syndrome and their symptoms over time and long COVID, it's very, very similar. It's just that there's very few people in the world with post sepsis syndrome. What, what, what is post sepsis? It's syndrome? where someone has a really bad pneumonia, is really, really sick, and they're in hospital for a couple of weeks and then they go out. Oh, okay. And, okay. you know, a month later, they're not quite like they were. They're fatigued, they're depressed, they're forgetful. Yeah. Sim similar things. Very, very similar. It's just that now we have a lot of people who've had this new infection to compare it with a very small number of people who've been in hospital and recovered with their pneumonia. Yeah. And, and la last question. Um, Someone's asking the Covaxin vaccine from India, the composition yeah. of Covaxin includes an inactivated coronavirus. Mm. What's your views on that versus other vaccines? I think, it's in, I think this makes the possibility that inactivated viral vaccines, which includes the China ones yeah. and Covaxin, may be beneficial because you're, all the other vaccines, such as AstraZeneca, J&J, &J, Pfizer, and Moderna, rely on an immune response to the spike. Yeah. Whereas with an inactivated virus, you're going to have an immune response to other proteins as well. It's going okay. to be much more polyclonal. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's kind of round off all the questions there. You know, we're, we're coming close to the hour now. I did want to talk about your book as well, Justin. Well, that's super sweet. Um, so let me just share the screen. I just wanted to show people um, how to get hold of it. So, you know, it's, it's on Amazon, Witness the COVID 2020, The Diary for Global Pandemic by Justin Stebbing. It's got some great, uh, got David Sinclair, some Michael Parkinson giving you shout outs then in the bylines, which is great. Um, we're, we're actually going to give a whole bunch of these books out to our super fans, our sort of members. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of people will be receiving uh, the books uh, quite soon. But Justin, I mean, I'm kind of halfway through the book. And for me, this is almost like the definitive reference guide to 2020, where in diary form, you go through like in January, this is what I was seeing. And this is what studies were being said. And then February, March, you go month by month. And it's, it's an amazing 
um, real time account of 2020. And very so, embarrassing too. So if you get it, I write in early February 2020. It's getting warmer in Wuhan. I think the worst of it's over, and this will be gone in a week. Yeah. And and was this was this an actual diary you wrote in real yeah. time? And, so it's and... real time. So it's not been. So <laughs> if it wasn't real time, I would have taken that out because <laughs> there's enough embarrassing information in there that I think, oh my gosh, did I really think that at the time? And of course, when you look back, like at a share price or yeah. a football match, you can always say, oh, that was obvious and that happened because of that. It's a lot harder, as we're now realizing with what's going to happen with Omicron, to say what's going to happen in the future. Now, in two weeks time, I can easily say to you, well, that was obvious why it just did yeah. that. And that's what happened. It's very difficult right now to say what's going to happen over the next two weeks. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, as, as kind of a researcher in markets, what I always like to do is like to go back to real um, real time accounts to see yeah. what was driving the price action. So your book for me is is an important. Um, but it also book describes how for us, um, with the artificial intelligence and benevolent AI, we came up, we looked for a drug that was both an antiviral and an anti-cytokine. We came up with this. And in nine months, we took it through all the clinical trials from computer all the laboratory work showing how it worked in the lab with super resolution microscopy showing it prevented the viruses getting into cells through to an FDA approval last November. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. just a pill you take once a day. Now, yeah. it stops people going to ITU. Steroids are very useful for people on intensive care. This is for hospitalized patients to stop them getting there. And it's a yeah. story of sort of global collaboration occurring at breakneck speed. Yeah. That's excellent. So I'd urge people to get the book. I'll send people the link uh, as well to, to the book. And Dominique, do you want to just add a few words to your views on, on you know, how the Fed and, you know, how policymakers are going to respond to this or have responded so far? Sure. Um, so the bar for policy response is going to be uh, higher this time around than it was uh, last year. Uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think a big driver of the policy response in the US was the electoral calendar. The pandemic happened to take place in an election year. Uh, then the party that uh, won the White House got a razor thin majority in Congress, so clearly was off to the races to try to limit uh, the damage that typically a midterm election does uh, to uh, the party in the White House. So that explains the scale of the fiscal uh, stimulus. Uh, but this strategy backfired because it created a demand shock. Uh, the stimulus checks were so high that people's income increased well above what it was before the pandemic. And to me, that's a big driver of the inflation we've had. And this inflation has dragged down the popularity of the administration and actually reduced uh, the chances that the Democrats will be able to keep Congress next year. So I don't think the administration is about to make the same mistakes. In addition to the feasibility of getting another big package uh, through Congress, given the lack of support of the uh, uh, centrist Democrats. So in order to see uh, the fiscal consolidation that's going on and that is really unprecedented in size, uh, we would need to see a really bad pandemic, perhaps uh, the panic around uh, toddlers that Justin was talking about. Um, so that's fiscal policy. Monetary policy, uh, we've just had the chair of the Fed telling us that he didn't think anymore that inflation was transitory uh, and that the Fed would pick up the pace or announce a faster taper next, uh, next uh, actually this, in, a, in a couple of weeks. Um, so that tells us uh, the Fed is much more focused on inflation. And the problem is that no matter what the Fed does, inflation is not going to come down much uh, because of the Fed, because it reflects A, this past fiscal policy shock I mentioned, and B, supply shocks over which monetary policy obviously uh, has no, uh, no control. Okay, so, that's great. Yeah. 
so the risk is that the Fed is going to tighten in a supply shock and that it's going to add downside to the economy. Yeah, that's great, great, Dominic. Thanks for that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, just a big, big thanks, Justin. I mean, obviously, it sounds like there's a high level of uncertainty right now. Hopefully, in a week's time, we'll learn a lot more. Israel's probably one of the countries to watch just because of the, the, sort of the depth and breadth of the data. Um, so next week could be quite pivotal for, for, for everything. I mean, from my side, like, you know, as, as Dominique's been saying, you know, I think it's it's too early to make big calls on, you know, in terms of economies and markets and such. Um, and yeah, Justin will stay in touch and, and you know, if, if needed, we'll, you know, try to communicate your views or, or maybe have another webinar if, if, oh, uh, if, if it's a requirement. Thanks so much. So just, just thanks big thanks again, you. Justin. Thanks. And uh, thanks everyone for okay, dialing in. Thanks. Okay, yeah. bye. Great, thanks. Thank you.